Oh, hello. I'm Arthur Colot, and I was just listening to one of my favorite songs, The Robots by Kraftwerk. Can you believe that this song was released in 1978? What visionaries. Nowadays, almost 50 years later, we have highly sophisticated technologies, smartphones and tablets, virtual assistants like Alexa and Siri, and artificial intelligence chatbots like ChatGPT. Imagine an artificially intelligent robot that could help people practice music. I think such a robot could be amazingly helpful to musicians in the practice rooms of symphony orchestras and at colleges and universities. Consider this post-it note that my father-in-law left for my wife and me a few years ago at the family beach house, which says, all you have to do is say, Alexa, play Grateful Dead at Cornell or other lesser musicians. This is my vision for the practice room robot, that an artificially intelligent virtual assistant robot can meet the many and various information needs of musicians in the practice room simply by talking to it. Imagine if all you had to do was say, robot, give me a metronome, or robot, play the other three parts in the quartet, or robot, video record this run through. Let's imagine what our practice room robot might look like. On the left is an image of Honda's Asimo robot, which has a humanoid form. Ours probably doesn't need to have legs unless we want the robot to walk somewhere, but maybe it should have hands in case we ever want it to mark time like a conductor does. The robot should definitely be connected to a tablet device on a music stand, as depicted in the image on the right. We might also want it connected to an electronic keyboard eventually too. And of course, we would want the robot to have microphones and speakers in order to record and playback audio. But in order to figure out how this robotic assistant might best help someone who is practicing music, let's first take a look at the target audience for this technology and why they need it in the practice room. I imagine the target audience to be music students at the college or university level. These are people, like the person in the picture, who are studying music as part of their post-secondary education. This picture comes from a practice room at UCLA, and rooms like this are quite common at music conservatories and university music departments. The strategy would be to station robots in the practice rooms on campus so that student musicians who book a room have access to a robot assistant that can facilitate practice in various ways. To understand how musicians might best utilize technology to enhance practicing, I'm going to rely on a fabulously interesting book called I Practice, Technology in the 21st Century Music Practice Room by Jennifer Mishra and Barbara Fast. Its five chapters run just over 100 pages, and it covers all sorts of technologies that can help musicians practice, such as metronome apps, tuners, music notation software, apps for sight reading and ear training, technology that provides virtual accompaniment, records lessons and run-throughs, and tracks practice goals. I haven't yet tried all the apps that Mishra and Fast recommend, but my favorite so far is the amazing Slow Downer app, which allows you to take a snippet of music and slow it down or speed it up without altering the pitch. This strikes me as an incredibly useful tool for a jazz musician who is trying to transcribe a solo. As you can see at the bottom right, I've been practicing round midnight to learn how to play it like Bill Evans. Mishra and Fast provide lists of app reviews on the iPractice Books companion website at Oxford University Press. I think a close reading of these lists would be the next step in determining the practice room robot's lists of desired capabilities. The robot would allow all these capabilities to be integrated and responsive to natural language conversation. To see how this would work, 
I'd like to look at metronomes, music notation, recording, and the amazing slow downer just a little bit closer. Let's start with metronomes. On the left is an image of my old fashioned metronome. It was actually part of a performance I saw of Georgi Ligeti's Poem Symphonique at the University of Chicago. Poem Symphonique is a 1962 piece that Ligeti composed for 100 metronomes, all set to different speeds. The university had to buy 100 metronomes for the performance, and afterward, I got this beautiful red metronome as part of their Adopt a Metronome program. On the right, you see screenshots of some of the metronome apps that Mishra and Fast review in their book. These images actually come from their reviews on the Oxford University Press companion website. And of course, the metronome apps today can do things that the traditional metronomes can't. For example, they can play unlimited different sounds and timbres, and even count the time in different languages. They can also be set to play very advanced compound meters and polyrhythms. This can be very helpful for students learning rhythmically difficult passages. Modern metronomes can also mute certain beats and measures, either specified by the performer or randomly selected by the app, which gives the musician valuable feedback about whether they are rushing or dragging the tempo when the beat disappears. Metronomes can also listen to a clapped, tapped, or snapped tempo and determine the beats per minute. Finally, apps like the Accelerando metronome allow the musician to set the starting and ending tempos over a specified time frame and have the metronomic beat accelerate or slow down accordingly. We might imagine our practice room robot could also mark the beats with flashing lights in different colors instead of sounds, or even conduct the beat with its arms. All you would have to do is say something like, robot, give me a metronome that beats eighth notes in four four with a snare drum on one, tom-tom on two, floor tom on three, and bass drum on four, and have the hi-hat on all the upbeats. Start at 60 beats per minute and go for 24 measures, end at 150 beats per minute, and please mute four randomly selected measures. This would open up a world of possibilities for spontaneously creating rhythmic practice exercises during the lesson or practice session. Musicians also need to mark up their music as they practice. They might mark up a score for any number of reasons. For example, people annotate their music with information about measure numbers, beats and meter, pitch adjustments, dynamics, cues, translations, pronunciations, breath marks, fingerings, bowings, articulations, rhythmic counting, and anything else they want to have in the part that they're using to practice from. Additionally, musicians may want to renotate a given score to simplify certain elements, like transposing passages to eliminate difficult to read clefs and leisure lines, or changing notes to their inharmonic equivalents to streamline the reading of accidentals. Music notation software helps the musician change the visual layout of the score in order to practice more profitably. Such software can also assist in creating flashcards of difficult passages. We might imagine that our robot has the ability to read a difficult passage and generate an etude designed to target the technical difficulty that the passage presents. All you have to do is say, robot, mark measure numbers, put in rhythmic counting for measures four to eight, transpose those measures from tenor to bass clef, then impose a key signature to minimize accidentals. Robot, I'm still having trouble with measures four to eight. Please generate an etude based on the technical challenges of this passage. Once you have the etude, all you have to do is say, thanks robot, now give me a metronome that randomly generates tempos between 60 and 150 beats per minute for five measures at a time. Musicians in the practice room need to be able to record themselves for a variety of reasons. Mishra and Fast call this the musical selfie. Hitting the record button can help musicians implement practice techniques such as focusing on playing a piece perfectly at a slower tempo, or doing a digital dress rehearsal, perhaps without even warming up to simulate the one-shot concert performance. In addition to simulating a performance situation, video recording also allows the musician to evaluate aspects of the execution after the fact, when you can watch yourself with undivided attention. 
Recording allows you to compare yourself to previous recordings, play along with yourself, and share your musical self selfies easily on platforms like YouTube. The main image in this slide is a screenshot from a YouTube video made by Daniel Mireles, an old friend of mine, exactly nine years ago to the day. Practicing music can be a very solitary activity, and I think sharing your practice on YouTube is a wonderful way to make it social. On the right are screenshots of video analysis apps from the reviews on the Oxford University Press companion site. Imagine if all you had to do was say, robot, record a video of me, which the robot could then help you analyze, compare, and share. Finally, I'd like to look at how useful the practice room robot could be for musicians wanting to play along with a recording. Recordings are one of the major information needs for music students and professional musicians. I'm only going to scratch the tip of the iceberg here, but back when I was in college, I transcribed a McCoy Tyner piano solo as part of a jazz styles analysis class. The idea of transcribing solos is that you can improve your harmonic improvisation by learning and internalizing what the masters did and incorporating it into your own playing. What you'll see in the video is me playing the opening melody of Round Midnight along with Bill Evans and his trio. I've taken only a small snippet and looped it. At first I slow it way down and then I speed it way up and finally I play it at its regular tempo. Once I have it under my fingers, to my satisfaction, I might ask my practice room robot to mark down the fingerings I want to use. Or I might put in a breath mark after the initial phrase to remind me to just wait an extra brief moment before starting the second phrase. Here's how the amazing Slow Downer app works. I'm on my way to sounding like Bill Evans in no time. I'd like to conclude my presentation with images from the 1980s sitcom Small Wonder, which I remember watching on TV as a kid. Vicky, the girl with the light bulb in her mouth, is really a robot being passed off as one of the children in the Lawson family. It was pretty funny. And it's a reminder to me of an earlier fascination with robots that is still present in our culture. In order to get the practice room robot idea off the ground quickly, I would imagine that universities with accounts and logins for current music applications might relatively quickly design a chat bot that could marshal them all and provide them as resources in the practice room through conversational interaction with the musician who is practicing. This would mean that all the necessary tools are together in a virtual toolbox, which is in the care of a virtual assistant. The impact of this is that musicians will start practicing in new ways, or perhaps 
new technologically enabled versions of old ways, or simply that it will make practicing with technology easier and therefore lead to new and innovative ways of learning, appreciating, playing, and composing music. As musicians are innovating ways of practicing and playing, the robot will also collect user feedback. This will ensure that it is evolving along with technology and user needs. Thank you very much for watching this presentation. Take care. Bye-bye.